Welcome back everyone and happy St. Patrick's Day. No green, full disclaimer. We got a green screen. So that would be a bad idea. You'd just be a um, floating Hubbard head here. So uh, we're going to pick up our discussion today. Yesterday we got introduced to IP addresses, this idea that effectively everyone has a mailing address. Every device connected to the internet has a mailing address. And we'll come back to that analogy because it's a pretty good one. And the way that information gets sent around the internet is you need to know an IP address to send it to, what device that, that data, that information uh, needs to go through via, via the IP address. And we also kind of talked about how websites, websites, all right, uh, let's ping netflix.com. Essentially, whenever you actually, t oh, maybe that's not a good one. Ooh, request timeout. Let's ping, let's ping the Google. So essentially, whenever you go to a website via a web browser, you type in some type of domain name, some type of address like google.com. Well, a DNS server, likely at your local ISP, internet service provider, is gonna translate that into the associated IP address to know what the IP address is to send that data. So we're gonna pick up there. Today we're talking about packets and we'll get into net neutrality and that'll be about as far as we actually get to in these slides today. So let's lead off with our video. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hi, my name is Lynn Root. I am a software engineer here at Spotify. And I'll be the first to admit that I often take for granted the reliability of the internet. The sheer amount of information zooming around the internet is astonishing. But how is it possible for every piece of data to be delivered to you reliably? Say you want to play a song from Spotify. It seems like your computer connects directly to Spotify's servers, and Spotify sends you a song on a direct, dedicated line. But actually, that's not how the internet works. If the internet were made of direct, dedicated connections, it would be impossible to keep things working as millions of users join, especially since there is no guarantee that every wire and computer is working all the time. Instead, data travels on the internet in a much less direct fashion. Many, many years ago, in the early 1970s, my partner Bob Kahn and I began working on the design of what we now call the internet. Bob and I uh, had the responsibility and the opportunity to design the internet's protocols and its architecture. So we persisted in participating in the internet's growth and evolution for all of this time up to and including the present. The way information gets transferred from one computer to another is pretty interesting. It need not follow a fixed path. In fact, your path may change in the midst of a computer to computer conversation. Information on the internet goes from one computer to another in what we call a packet of information. And a packet travels from one place to another on the internet, a lot like how you might get from one place to another in a car. Depending on traffic congestion or road conditions, you might choose or be forced to take a different route to get to the same place each time you travel. And just as you can transport all sorts of stuff inside a car, many kinds of digital information can be sent with IP packets, but there are some limits. What if, for example, you need to move a space shuttle from where it was built to where it will be launched? The shuttle won't fit in one truck, so it needs to be broken down into pieces, transported using a fleet of trucks. They could all take different routes and might get to the destination at different times, but once all the pieces are there, you can reassemble the pieces into the complete shuttle and it'll be ready for launch. All right, I'm gonna back him up here because this is actually like super important. This is like the key idea. So remember this guy, Vint Cerf, he basically comes up with this idea. Well, so he had a predecessor that came up with this idea of a packet switching network, but they worked on IP, TCP to basically develop the packing switching network that we're currently using for the internet. And so data, this is a good analogy here with the spaceship. We got something big that we want to basically send over the internet, some type of file. So think, I don't know, this video that you're watching. Well, I can't just squeeze the entire space shuttle, the entire video through the internet. Instead, we're gonna break it down into packets. We'll talk about packets a little bit more, but basically we section off the data 
we fragment it. And then we send it out over the internet. What if, for example, you need to move a space shuttle from where it was built to where it will be launched? The shuttle won't fit in one truck, so it needs to be broken down into pieces, transported using a fleet of trucks. They could all take different routes. <coughs> so that's another key part of this. And what actually makes it so revolutionary is that once we break it up into packets, we can send it to its destination through the internet. And because we're working with like smaller bits of data, um, they can be sent different routes and actually all get there um, effectively at the same time, such a type of situation. They don't have to get there at the same time. Um, as we're going to see, there's an important identification number that is assigned to each packet. And so when the packets actually arrive at different intervals, you can reassemble them based on those IDs. And might get to the destination at different times, but once all the pieces are there, you can reassemble the pieces into the complete shuttle and it'll be ready for launch. On the internet, the details work similarly. If you have a very large image that you want to send to a friend or upload to a uh, website, that image might be made up of tens of millions of bits or ones and zeros, too many to send along in one packet. Since it's data on a computer, the computer sending the image can quickly break it into hundreds or even thousands of smaller parts called packets. Unlike cars or trucks, these packets don't have drivers and they don't choose their route. Each packet has the internet address of where it came from and where it's going. Special computers on the internet called routers act like traffic managers to keep the packets moving through the networks smoothly. If one route is congested, individual packets may travel different routes through the internet and they may arrive at the destination. So here I'm going to get to this question. So do packets actually know the most efficient route? Well, it's actually up to these things, these routers, to basically tell them where to go. So uh, whenever data leaves your device, it's going to hit your router, and then it's going to go to your local internet service provider. Somebody like Comcast or AT&T has a server that is somewhat local. For instance, basically there's one that covers like all the Atlanta area for each of those. And then from there, it's going to hit other major routers before hitting its, uh, the actual destination. So to answer your question, do they know the most efficient route? Well, each time it hits a router, it checks in that moment, what is the most efficient route from here? Where should I go from here? And so each of those, we call them hops. Each time we hit a router, it's going to basically check again, what is the most efficient route? And so it's possible that some packets start out going to the same router and then from there, split and go different directions. At slightly different times or even out of order. So let's talk about how this works. As part of the internet protocol, every router keeps track of multiple paths for sending packets and it chooses the cheapest available path for each piece of data based on destination IP address for the packet. Cheapest in this case doesn't mean cost, but time and non-technical factors such as politics and relationships between companies. Often the best route for data to travel isn't necessarily the most direct. Having options for paths makes the network fault tolerant, which means the network can keep sending packets even if something goes horribly, horribly wrong. This is the basis for a key principle of the internet, reliability. Now, what if you want to request some data and not everything is delivered? Say you want to listen to a song. How can you be 100% sure all the data will be delivered so the song plays perfectly? Introducing your new best friend TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. TCP manages the sending and receiving of all your data as packets. Think of it like a guaranteed mail service. When you request a song on your device, Spotify sends a song broken up into many packets. When your packets arrive, TCP does a full inventory and sends back acknowledgments of each packet received. If all packets are there, TCP signs for your delivery and you're done. If TCP finds some packets are missing, it won't sign. Otherwise, your song wouldn't sound as good or portions of the song could be missing. For each missing or incomplete packet, Spotify will resend them. Once TCP verifies the delivery of many packets for that one song request, your song will start to play. What's great about the TCP and router systems is they're scalable. They can work with eight devices or eight billion devices. In fact, because of these principles of fault tolerance and redundancy, the more routers we add, the more reliable the internet becomes. 
What's also great is we can grow and scale the internet without interrupting service for anybody using it. The internet is made of hundreds of thousands of networks and billions of computers and devices connected physically. These different systems that make up the internet connect to each other, communicate with each other, and work together because of agreed upon standards for how data is sent around on the internet. Computing devices or routers along the internet help all the packets make their way to the destination where they're reassembled if necessary in order. This happens billions of times a day, whether you and others are sending an email, visiting a web page, doing a video chat, using a mobile app, or when sensors or devices on the internet talk to each other. I'm going to get to some of these questions because they're they're really good. So related questions: uh, What happens during packet loss, and how do you lose a packet? So these packets, as we're going to see, is part of their data. Let's uh, trying to see it. Time to live. So essentially, we're, we're going to come back to this slide in just a moment. But part of a packet's data is time to live. That is how long before we basically give up on it. So a protocol that we're going to dive into a lot more tomorrow is TCP. And effectively using the TCP protocol, which is this is a lot, if not most of the traffic that is on the Internet goes through TCP. Basically, once all the packets arrive at the destination, we're going to check to see, do we have all the packets? And the way that we know if we have all the packets is an ID number. If it's missing a packet, it's going to send back a request saying, hey, I got all the packets. I, I didn't get these packets. Could you send those again? And in theory, they get sent again. So TCP is basically going to check to make sure that every packet is there for saying, yeah, we got the complete file. Now, that's super important for a lot of data. Um, text, for instance, like uh, as we kind of talked about with lossy and lossless compression, I can't really afford to lose some data out of my spreadsheet. So it's important that I do get all the packets for something like that. However, um, that takes time. It takes time to receive packets and then request the packets that you missed. And so there are certain protocols. UDP is one that we're going to take a look at again a little bit more in depth tomorrow. This is what you use for stuff like online gaming or online video streaming, kind of what's happening now. In the events where you lose a packet with video and your video games, A, there's already so many packets, so losing you know just a couple isn't that big of a deal. But it's also, in the case of like video, it's similar to our lossy, lossless compression. Losing the packets is just, it's just not a big deal. You won't even actually notice the difference, but also it's time sensitive. Right. Uh, in the case of this video that you're watching, the packets that you missed, it's too late. Like we're not going to go back and get those packets and then try to insert them. Now, um, in the case of something like Spotify or YouTube, that's where buffering comes into play. So basically, um, you're guaranteed to have all of the packets in advance before it gets shown to you. So the those uh, those services are going to pre-buffer the data, make sure that all the packets are there before even trying to show it to you. But in the case of something like live streaming or playing video games online, that won't necessarily work. Okay, good questions. Let's come back. So the internet is ultimately just a packet switching network. Basically, we're able to send data all data doesn't matter, right? I mean, whenever this thing was created, nobody envisioned that we would be live streaming Twitch. But the way this thing was assembled, it's highly scalable. And so we're just taking whatever the data is, be it text, be it video, breaking it down into packets, and then ascending that over uh, the internet where it gets reassembled at its destination. The amount of time it takes for a packet to travel from the source of the destination is known as latency or ping. And we actually saw this yesterday, so I'm going to get to the question of um, how long does this take? Well, this is the uh, Windows ping tool. Uh-oh, a little request timeout here. But I am pinging Google.com. So yesterday when we talked about DNS, right, I'm using Google.com. The DNS server knows what IP address is associated with that. Let's run this again. 
I don't, I don't know why that stopped. So, I'm saying google.com, the DNS server is translating that to the associated IP address, and so we're pinging that. Now, there are several actual Google servers, so likely one nearby, and let's, uh, let's just time that out. Oops, timed out the wrong person. There we go. Uh, so there's actually a time column here, and this is round trip. So it's taking you know, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds for milliseconds for packets of information to go to Google and come back. So the idea of getting um, this information, like the TCP is actually pretty fast. It's actually pretty fast to ensure that we have all of the packets because we're talking milliseconds here. So uh, this is known as latency or ping, essentially how long it takes for packets to travel to the destination. And with the case of IP version 4, which again is how most internet traffic is still being routed around the internet despite the fact that we're transitioning to IP version 6, this means that if we take a one gigabyte file, such as a video, we're going to break it down into lots of packets, about 15,000. Now that's if you just literally take this number, 64 kilobytes, and do some division to see how many packets we're actually producing. But it's going to be a little bit more than that. Realities are it's going to take more packets than this because that 64 kilobytes of packets, that's not everything. We have essentially the payload, which is... Um, the, the, the actual data, the important information, but you also have header information. Back to this slide. Okay. So I don't want you to look at this and get overwhelmed. There's some important parts here. There is this ID number, which I talked about uh, just briefly a moment ago in terms of TCP IP. The ID number, basically every packet gets assigned some type of number so that once it reaches its destination, TCP A, knows that it has all the packets, and then B can put them back in the correct order. Also important here is our source address. That's going to be an IP address. Notice the 32 bits, right? We talked about how, to, how an IP version 4 IP address takes up 32 bits or 4 bytes. The destination address, also IP version 4. This is where it's going. So those three pieces of information, every packet, every single packet, right? We're talking about a video. 15,625 packets, probably more, is going to have this data, this metadata, this header information uh, associated with it. It's got an ID number, it's got a source address, that is where did it come from, it's got a destination address. So that's the important part, although I did touch on this time to live. So the information found in this, it takes up 20 bytes, that's not like a big deal but it does take up some of that data, which is why I'm saying that it probably takes more than 15,000 packets or so in order to uh, break down a one gigabyte file. So um, this is all part of like the protocol stuff. When we talk about protocols, it's basically standards. It's like people sitting down and agreeing like, hey, this information is the important stuff. It should be included. You kind of want to minimize how much space it takes up. Uh, but you also, I mean, it, it's, it's a give and a take there. And so they have decided on 20 bytes of information is enough to convey everything they need in the uh, packet header for an IP version 4 packet. This header information, it's public knowledge. What do I mean? We're going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity and encryption a little bit later. But the payload, the stuff that's actually being transferred, the, the data, you know, uh, we're talking the website that you're visiting, the video that you're trying to receive. When it gets broken down, those are payloads. That's separate from the header information. This is header information. And what I'm saying is that this header information is public knowledge. The stuff that's in the payload, we're going to talk about a, bit, a little bit later, that should be encrypted. But this stuff, this is public. So it needs to be public, right? We have the source IP address. So whenever this packet hits a router, the router's got to know where it needs to go. It, it's got to know the destination address. It also has to know the source address. That has to be sent along. So when it actually does reach the destination and maybe packets are missing, we know to where to send the request to. So this is public information. Okay. 
Got a little appendix here. So while the header information in a packet is public knowledge, the data within the packet, known as the payload, is often encrypted <clears throat> to prevent packet sniffing. Think of a packet like a sealed envelope. Again, our mail analogy is coming back. Important information, that is the source or return address, and the destination or the to address are openly visible to anyone to read while the contents are hidden, in theory. <laughs> we'll talk about that. In theory, the contents is encrypted, it's hidden. The openness of the header information is how internet service providers, give me some internet service providers in, in Twitch chat, right? We're talking Comcast, AT&T, uh, kind of depends on your regional area. ISPs are able to throttle particular services such as Netflix. So almost every packet travels through an ISP router at some point in its journey. Uh, I actually have a good picture here. We'll come back to this image probably a little bit tomorrow, but this is what the internet like actually looks like in terms of a network, right? Each line is an IP address and you see this little bit that we're zoomed in on. This kind of represents a region, right? So maybe your school is one of these nodes and maybe your home is another one of these nodes and maybe one of these is a local business. All those things are going to some type of regional ISP, okay, such as Comcast, AT&T, Google Fiber, big shout out there. So with that in mind, what's actually important to note is on the other end of this, right, like so I'm going to send stuff from my home, it hits my local ISP, it's going to go out to the major core of the internet, bounce around, and then to get to like a Netflix server or a Google server, a YouTube server, something like that, it's going to arrive at another star network that looks a little bit like this before actually hitting the end. And so that's super important to talk about net neutrality. Uh, so the openness of the, 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 the header information in each packet, it's public, it has to be. It has to be to know how to route the, the uh, packets. But because it is open and public, it allows certain ISPs to throttle particular services. Almost every packet travels through an ISP, as we just looked at with that image. While the ISP is unable to decrypt the contents of the packet, in theory, the payload is encrypted and they can't see it. The ISP doesn't necessarily know what you're watching on Netflix. What they can do is look at the header information and know that you are watching Netflix. At that point, the ISP can choose to delay or even deny delivery of the packet. So, right, we can see where we can ping Google, for instance, right? So this IP address, that is in the header information of the packets that I'm sending to Google right now. So that is, these packets are routing through my local ISP. They know that I'm pinging Google. Why? Because an IP address like this it's, it's well known, right? Like Google's a very established um, service, so they know that I'm pinging Google. All they see is this, but they know that IP address is associated with Google. Likewise, there's gonna be one associated with Netflix. Ugh. This timed out earlier when I did it. It's kind of interesting. But, so I'm trying to ping Netflix, right? What's important here is this IP address. Anybody, can figure out what the IP address of Netflix is. So when packets go through your router, you can just look at it. I don't necessarily know what's in the packet because it's encrypted, but I can see that you are trying to communicate with Netflix. So at that point, the ISP can choose to delay or even deny delivery of the packet. And this is a violation of net neutrality. Let's watch a quick video on net neutrality and talk about why it's important. Does this bother you? What if you had to pay to make it go away? We often assume that all the information on the internet is equally accessible. It's not quite as simple as that, but this ideal is the basis of net neutrality. It's an issue that's been on the agenda in the US for years, but it actually affects people all over the world. Here's the problem. 
Without net neutrality, your internet service provider, or ISP, such as BT or Comcast, could influence what you see and how quickly you see it. In order for you to watch YouTube, browse Facebook, or read the news, you need an ISP to connect you to that content. Net neutrality demands that ISPs should treat all web traffic the same. Let's think about that in terms of real traffic. The ISPs are like the road between Tech City, where companies like Amazon and Google are based, and Consumerville, where you live. These companies have to send information along the road, which is owned by the ISP. Currently, vehicles from Google and vehicles from a small company travel on the same road at the same speed. The ISP cannot favor one over the other, so the Google van cannot overtake its competitor's little car. But imagine the road is converted into a highway with a fast and slow lane. To access the fast lane, companies have to pay the ISP more money. This favors big companies who can afford to pay. Some companies might even be denied access to the road altogether. It would be the ISP's choice. Without net neutrality, the ISP highway has stopped treating all traffic the same. What does this mean for you? Well, without net neutrality, you might find some services slow down unless your favorite sites pay the ISPs. This has happened before. In 2014, before net neutrality regulations were enshrined in law in the US, Comcast customers noticed Netflix streaming speeds plummeting. It wasn't until Netflix agreed to pay Comcast more money that streaming speed shot up again. It could also lead to higher prices for you. ISPs could charge premium prices for people who want to watch a video or listen to music at peak times. And if companies are forced to pay for the fast lane, the price increase might be pushed back onto the consumer. That means you could end up paying more to browse your favorite sites. You might even notice a decrease in the quality of content. While larger companies can afford to pay up for better service delivery, smaller companies may not be able to keep up. Less competition means less pressure to improve products and services. And if smaller companies fold, the consumer will have less choice. ISPs could choose to slow down content of any kind. Let's take the business of streaming video. If Netflix makes an arrangement with an ISP, the ISP could block Netflix's competitors from reaching customers. Many ISPs have started their own streaming services. They could favor their own content and block competitors out completely. And it's not just about business. They could also censor content that they disagree with. ISPs argue that if there was less regulation and they were able to charge a premium for faster service, they could reinvest the money in better infrastructure. This could include improved access for people in remote and rural areas. If popular services like YouTube are putting more strain on the ISP's network, it makes sense for them to pay more anyway, right? But YouTube would say it's not their job to improve the internet, just as it's not BMW's job to build better roads. What's more, many argue that any extra money paid to ISPs would really just go into the pockets of shareholders. One thing's certain, net neutrality creates a level playing field which spurs innovation. Small companies can easily challenge competitors which motivates them both to improve their products. Small startups have a fighting chance to grow and even surpass their big rivals. That's how Facebook rose from humble origins in Mark Zuckerberg's university dorm room to domination over market leader MySpace. ISPs also argue that any consumers who don't like the way they operate can always choose to switch providers. But it's not that simple. Many people only have access to adequate broadband from one internet provider in their area. Without net neutrality, that one ISP could have a lot of control over what those consumers get to see online. So what do you think? Should net neutrality rules be protected, loosened a little, or even scrapped altogether? Wow, shout out to the BBC. That is... That's an awesome video. Um, so a lot of this kind of arose maybe 2013, 2014-ish. There's the Comcast in Dallas, uh, I believe. It's definitely one of the Texas areas. Was throttling Netflix. And Netflix was like... Let me get back to where we were. The Comcast in Dallas was throttling Netflix. And then Netflix approached them and said, hey, you're throttling us, particularly during peak hours. Um, could you stop? And Comcast was like, uh, what are you talking about? We're not throttling you. And then Netflix presented them all this data showing where they were getting throttled. 
And he's like, yeah, you're throttling us and only us. And the Comcast and Dallas was just like, uh, yeah, yeah, we're throttling you, and we're going to keep throttling you into, unless you pay us a lot of money. Okay, so me as like an end-level consumer, I actually noticed this um, down in Valdosta, where I'm from. A similar thing was happening during prime time, right? Like, you go to 8 p.m., you hop on Netflix, stuff's buffering. You go to YouTube and stream high-definition video, not a problem. Like, it was nuts. And if you are uninformed and you don't really know better, your first thought is just like, wow, Netflix sucks. I'm going to cancel my service, right? This is unwatchable. And basically Comcast was like relying on that, you know, that, um, that if you're Netflix, you got to shell out money or else you're going to lose customers. And they did. They started paying Comcast. So this is what we're talking about is a violation of net neutrality. And there's there are problems from all different angles, as we kind of saw in our video. Um, for if they're going to do that, right? Like uh, a company like Comcast, who is associated with NBC, I believe they own NBC, which is associated with Hulu. They have a big part in Hulu. Comcast can favor their own streaming service over Netflix, forcing Netflix to basically hemorrhage money or hemorrhage customers and that sort of thing. But if you're like a little small, small startup and you start to get into the game, how are you gonna compete with that? Like, you can't pay money. So if Comcast decides to bully your service, you're just never gonna take off. And so this is a problem. And during the Obama administration, uh, he appointed uh, Tom Wheeler, the chairman of the FCC, who is over basically uh, this, this type of thing. And that was actually a scary time because Tom Wheeler actually worked for, uh, he was a lobbyist for uh, wireless networks, something like that. And so we were a little concerned, but as he got in there, one of the things he was trying to do was make the internet a utility, basically bringing it under the, the government umbrella. It would be considered almost necessary in the same way that water or electricity is necessary. And once they do that, once they make it a utility, the government has some oversight on it. Now, that sounds really bad if you have some conservative values. And I kind of agree with the situation. What the ISPs would argue is it, you could just switch. You could just switch to someone else. But in actuality, most of us don't really have a good option. Uh, we're kind of blessed in it, the Atlanta area, but even then we're limited to likely two options. Most people have access to a cable company like Comcast or AT&T, which is uh, DSL, is actually a slightly different service. And that's their two options, okay? Some don't even have that much, as much as 70% of the United States only have literally one. And so this idea that if you don't like it, you can just switch to someone else is not really realistic. So um, we got some issues here with net neutrality. Uh, with the, the current administration, there's a gentleman by the name of Jeet Pai, who took over as FCC chairman and basically rolled back all of the changes that Tom Wheeler made as chairman. And that was the last we kind of heard of it. Now, who knows where things are currently? We'll see. But the, the potential here is really bad. So um, we're actually going to kind of pause there today. We're about 35 minutes into a stream here. I'm trying to keep these links a little bit low. But net neutrality is really interesting. I recommend you check out some more videos. There's lots on YouTube on this subject. Some are really entertaining. But we'll pick up tomorrow, uh, talk a little bit more about TCP, IP, and I'll get to this VPN question tomorrow. See y'all.